Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Ghost, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Words taken from the gospel for low Sunday in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Imagine for a moment you're in a big truck. A big truck that has been loaded down with boxes. These boxes are causing the truck to be weighed down, right? If you have ever studied physics, you might recall the simple equation P equals MV where P is momentum, which is calculated by multiplying mass times velocity. This simply means when something has a lot of weight, a lot of mass, it does not take much velocity to have lots of momentum too. When something has momentum, it wants to keep on going. That's the point. In our analogy of the heavily laden truck, we can imagine what happens when it comes to a A stoplight is turned red. Applying the brakes helps, but the truck is slow in stopping due to the momentum. Due to the momentum. And so the truck just goes right on through the light. The truck is our soul. The truck is our soul. The red light is temptation. Something we know we must not do, must not look at or visit. A bar for a drunkard, a casino for a gambler, or some website, game, or movie for others. The heavy boxes are the temporal debt of punishment due for our sins. How can we unload them? Well, many rightly start by going to confession. But we must understand that confession, first and foremost, takes away the guilt and the eternal debt of punishment for sin if we're truly sorry and have a firm purpose of amendment. Guilt, if you remember your catechism, means we're responsible. We have ownership of our sins. They're mine. We don't want to meet the judge with ownership of our sins. We want them gone. So with confession, a great exchange takes place. His majesty, our Lord and Savior, takes them to himself, writing his name in blood over ours. But we must not forget that each sin also brings stain to our souls and a temporal debt of punishment. Even these can be lightened and removed in confession, but it takes a lot of sorrow for that to happen. Thus the heavy boxes. The more we sin, the more boxes. The heavier the truck. Even after confession. In order for the heavy boxes to be reduced... We have to work lots outside of the confessional. Thus, it's called the sacrament of penance. It's not just penitential going in. It's penitential coming out, too, and carrying on with what's required. So this means the sacrament of penance is only part of the answer to overcoming sin. We have to work outside work hard outside the confessional to reap the full fruits. Although repeated confession is helpful and at times necessary as a sort of keeping oneself accountable and responsible to our father confessors, nevertheless, unpacking the boxes is a must if we are not going to become recidivists. Fancy word for someone who fails to amend their lives. They relapse regularly into the same old ways, 
failing to even try to offload the boxes. They just add to them instead. They just add more and more weight. For such ones, it doesn't take long before they start making sacrilegious confessions too because they're not really truly sorry. You must avoid that. Thus, the patron of the confessional, one of them, and the doctor of moral theology, St. Alphonsus, says, of what use is it to receive absolution as often as you go to confession when you do not renounce sin? All those absolutions would add to the fire that would torment you in hell. Listen to the Code of Canon Law. If the confessor is in no doubt about the penitent's disposition, and the penitent asks for absolution, it is not to be denied or deferred. Canon 980. But what if the confessor is in doubt? What if the penitents do not have the proper disposition? Absolution clearly must be deferred or delayed until they start the unpacking process. So, for example, maybe someone has trouble with drink. Priest asks them, do you have anything at home? Well, now that you mention it, I got a fifth at home. What should be happening in this case? Go home, dump it down the drain, come back, and we'll give you absolution. Prove that you're serious about unpacking that box. Again, listen to St. Alphonsus. When the confessor knows that it will be useful to defer absolution, he is bound to defer it. For he is obliged to adopt the most efficacious remedies for the amendment of his penitent. Thank you, St. Alphonsus. It's well known that the great confessor, St. Padre Pio, most days, most days, he delayed or denied more people absolution than he gave absolution. In the first part of the prayer, before hearing confessions, the priest prays thus, Give me, O Lord, the wisdom that sitteth by thy throne, that I may be enabled to judge thy people with justice and thy poor and humble ones with true judgment. And then comes this line, Grant me so to handle the keys of the kingdom of heaven that I may open it to none. That I may open it to none who ought to be shut out. Nor shut out any to whom I ought to open. Wow. In 1962 ritual for hearing confessions, the priest is instructed thus. The priest must take great pains great pains to decide in which instances absolution should be given, denied, or deferred, lest he absolve such as are indisposed for this benefit. Persons, for example, who give no indication of contrition, who refuse to put an end to hatred and enmity, who refuse to make restitution when they're able, or give up an approximate occasion of sin, or in any way refuse to forsake their sins and amend their lives. See then, in all that I've been telling you so far, what is the church saying in so many different ways? Through prayer, through the ritual, through the law, through her saints. Unpack the boxes. That's it. Unpack those boxes. You're going to stop when the light turns red. That's what the church wants. Thus, St. Robert Bellarmine has this amazing line. There would not be such great ease in sinning if there were not also such great ease in absolving. For the sacraments to work, we must conform ourselves to the sacrament and not make it conform to us. This is not the sacrament of absolution where you just put in a couple of coins and pull, okay, I'm ready. No, the priest is in a position of judge. 
He's going to instruct you. We have to go along with what he says. So we have three acts of the penitent. This is the sacrament of penance. We have to do some penance. It's not easy. Here are the three acts. Three things from which the penitent needs to do to make it valid. First and foremost, sorrow for sins committed with the resolve to commit them no more. Number one, sorrow for sins committed with the resolve to commit them no more. Number two, a complete confession of the sins. Sins committed. Now, if they're mortal, everyone's got to be named as best you can. If they're venial, you only need to name a sin. But with mortal sins, you must hate each sin. Therefore, they each need to be confessed as best you can. Obviously, that's not always easy after a long time. We'll talk about that. Number three, willingness to perform the penance imposed on him by the confessor. So sorrow, amendment of life, a complete confession, and a willingness to perform the penance imposed. Clearly, a good examination of conscience is needed beforehand, and oftentimes the priest can help if necessary. And one should not wait too long to go to confession lest they start forgetting sins. That can happen pretty easy too. Again, as best as possible, each mortal sin ought to be confessed, must be confessed which can be trying after years of being away. Thus, an easier way to do it would be to simply say, I did this once a month, once a week, for a year or five years or whatever. See, then you got it. In any case, notice the importance of sorrow. Curie of ours held that the people should spend more time bringing up their sorrow for sin than confessing them with precision. This is because grace is bestowed in confession in proportion to our sorrow for sin. The more sorrow, the more grace. And the more timely and energetically we'll unpack those boxes. That's very attractive. Now, given the heavy laden truck, what we need to concentrate then is on that sorrow for sin, which demands amendment of life. It demands we unpack those boxes. So all that we said above rests on this. Well, again, we turn to the Code of Canon Law. In order that Christ faithful may receive the saving remedy of the sacrament of penance, they must be so disposed that repudiating the sins they have committed and having the purpose of amending their lives, they turn back to God. Thus, we hear in the act of contrition, I firmly resolve with the help of thy grace to confess my sins, to do penance, and to amend my life. Amen. Please be sure to use that formula that's in the confessional. It's got all the necessary ingredients, and it's important for the priest to hear you say those words. I also encourage you to say this and memorize it. I think the reason I'm here before you today as a priest is that when my father sent me on errands for the business, I'd always go by St. Patrick's, the church downtown in my hometown. It was always open. I'd go in, look at the red light. I knew there was someone there. And I made an act of contrition every single time. I think that's why I'm here. One of the reasons. They'll save your soul. Learn your act of contrition and say it over and over. It's powerful and important prayer. Perhaps another analogy will help us today. We can think of overcoming serious sins as walking along the edge of a cliff. One misstep. One misstep. And we're off. Into the pit of mortal sin, with no guarantee that God's going to pull us out. Sometimes God just lets them go for a long time. Thus, people come back for 10, 20, 30, even 60 years of being away. God did not call them back until the very end, some of them. And even then, some don't make it. 
Do not say, I'll sin today and go to confession tomorrow. Always try to avoid the edge of the cliff, in other words. The truly penitent soul, wanting and willing to unpack the boxes, strives to put distance between himself and the edge so that any slip will not be fatal. Such efforts increase the stopping distance of the truck. Some examples might be resisting faults like vulgar language, poor use of time, cleaning the house of all secular worldly things. Clean out your life. Start pulling away from the edge. For those who have ears to hear, I'm simply giving you another way of seeing St. Teresa's interior castle. Get out of the first mansion and get into the second and the third. Get away from the edge of the cliff. By going to confession frequently, we are saying we are more and more willing to unpack the boxes. Frequent confession translates into, I'm trying to unpack these boxes and I'm serious about it. I'm more willing to walk away from the edge. Now, this is not easy, so we put handouts on our website. If you've not seen them, download them and read them. Battle plans against sin, advice from St. Thomas and St. Philip and so on. And as a side note here, I want to say this important practical note. Be sure you are courteous to others. If you're a frequent confessee, a frequent penitent, be sure you are courteous to others who would like to go to confession too, but live some distance away. Thus, for those living nearby and able to attend daily mass or come sometime during the week, please allow more chances for those driving from afar to confess with more ease on weekends. This is an act of charity and simple neighborly awareness and kindness. Keep in mind, many are only able to come on Sundays. They work all week. And sometimes there's only one confessor, like there was today. St. John Climacus says, Repentance, that is, amendment of life, is the renewal of baptism and a contract with God for a fresh start in life. Repentance goes shopping for humility and is ever distrustful of bodily comfort. Repentance is critical awareness and a sure watch over oneself, vigilance. Repentance, amendment of life, is the daughter of hope and the refusal to despair. Repentance is reconciliation with the Lord by the performance of good deeds, which are the opposites of the sins. It is the purification of the conscience and the voluntary endurance of affliction. The penitent deals out his own punishment, For repentance is the fierce persecution of the stomach and the flogging of the soul into an intense awareness. Thank you, St. John Climacus. Now let's practice this repentance, this amendment of life. We can do so in three ways. And we'll be unpacking those boxes. Number one, we strive to make the occasions of sin remote. We energetically avoid going to places where we have fallen heretofore. If a device is a problem, then amendment would demand we make it much harder to use. We use it only in public, or we simply take a hammer to it. We hit the delete button over and over and over again. Or perhaps just get a light phone. Walk away from the edge by cutting out all bad music that opens doors useless games, and so on. Say no even to legitimate pleasures to build up stopping distance when the light turns red. That's the scheme of the saints. We strive to make the occasions of sin remote. Number two, we perform some bodily penances as constant reminders that we are sinners in need of constant reformation. Thus, we get up 
at a fixed time. We take partly cold showers, kiss the ground, as Our Lady told St. Bernadette to do, and say our prayers. We must be convinced and accept such penance as a lifelong endeavor and be about ever looking for new ways to augment what we've already been doing, never being satisfied with the status quo. Number three, we formulate a plan or rule of life. It doesn't have to be complicated. It could be a note card. Herein, we place what prayers we plan to say, what books we will read regularly, such as the imitation of Christ, the passion of our Lord, in the Gospels, something. In this way, we strive to purify the mind and memory with doctrine and acts of faith. The heart is purified with acts of hope and love and doing virtuous deeds. We plan visits to the most blessed of all sacraments. We have times of meditation. Pray the daily rosary, stations of the cross, consecration to Jesus living in Mary, enthronements, sacramentals, and be always busily laboring to fulfill our duties of state. And report to the priest the things you do to overcome your sins. He needs to hear it. He sees your unpacking, that you're worthy of absolution. Such a soul is on his way to becoming a saint if he firmly resolves not to sin again and goes about putting such resolutions into practice. Now, to be fair, God does allow certain faults and failings to remain in us in order to keep us humble and give us that needed struggle which makes saints. But we must be completely convinced that God always, always, gives the needed grace to avoid and conquer each and every mortal sin, always and everywhere, when we turn to him and fight. And what is more, we must be thoroughly convinced this unpacking of the boxes can be done and must be done. It has been done by others. I don't care how full your truck is. I don't care if it's the heaviest truck on earth right now. It can be unpacked. It has been done, and it can be done again. Never despair. If they can do it before our time, so can we. They're human, just like us. St. Peter denied his majesty three times. Our blessed Lord gave Peter all he needed to prevent this fall. But after calling the first pope back from his sin, St. Peter responded to the graces of conversion and to amend his life. He never denied his majesty again and wept so many tears of compunction that tradition tells us he had furrows in his cheeks. St. Thomas failed his majesty too. We heard it today in the gospel. But after today's amazing encounter with the sacred wounds of our Savior, his glorified body, St. Thomas became among the most far-reaching and effective of the apostles, reaching even unto the far east of India. Oh, how pleased God must have been with those two penitent apostles. We'll end by asking a simple question. When will we know God is pleased? When will we know the boxes are unpacked? Simply this, there's no more momentum. We now can stop at the red light without trouble. We confess lighter sins and use our old sins for increasing our sorrow. Sorrow is necessary for confession. The more sorrow, the more grace. Confess old sins to bring up your sorrow. They're forgiven but you're still sorry for them and you can bring up your sorrow for the maximum grace. We turn them then into fertilizer for growing the opposite virtues. This is what the saints did. And Climacus, St. John Climacus, gives us this final thought. A proof of our having been delivered from our failings 
is the unceasing acknowledgement of our indebtedness. A sign of true repentance is the admission that all our troubles, and more besides, whether visible or not, are richly deserved. No more pointing fingers at everybody else for our problems. That's when you know the boxes are being unpacked. I hope to speak more on this sacrament in the future. Stay tuned. May we all be saved souls together in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.